I drew in books when I was you know, three and four. We had a book that uh, my sister was given by her grandma and my very tolerant sister wasn't upset when I'd drawn on every single blank area in the book. But I had a recurring dream as a child. And in this recurring dream, all the houses in New York Terrace, the roofs of all those houses were on fire. And there were cat skins, sounds a bit illogical, but don't forget it's a dream, were stretched from the guttering up to the apex of the roof. And they didn't disintegrate, but were flamed. And there were people in the yard screaming. It's, it's, it's occurred to me lots of times, or it kind of epiphany, I suppose, when I was, I don't know, what age, that no matter what um, direction you're coming to York from, north, south, east, or west, it's the first thing you see. It kind of um, defines, uh, acts, acts like a trig point in a way, so you could guide yourself into the city just by seeing the Minster. The external view that interests me is, is from the bar walls. It always looks like a vast ship on a kind of sea of roofs. It seems to be floating there quite ephemerally sometimes, because the, as the light passes across it, it changes all the time. But that's rather beautiful and uh, evocative. And then drawing it from the outside, drawing, the, drawing it from the bar walls or somewhere, or just in the, uh, in the Dean's Park, is interesting, because then when you come inside and draw it, you've got this sense of internal and external space, and the way, that, um, the way it looks from the outside dictates, obviously, the way it looks on the inside. Uh, so drawing that's quite revelatory. Central tower soars so high. So I've stood on it a lot and drawn the surrounding landscape. But the inside seems to me to be very light and airy and it means a great deal to me because I was brought here a lot by my father when I was younger. Uh, but it's just airy and quite magnificent. And the obvious parallel is it looks, everybody says this, but it, it's, it, just, it looks like um, a forest and you get this sense of walking through um, a glade with the columns being the tree trunks. But the other thing that interests me about Gothic architecture, Romanesque architecture in particular, is um, they have a fantastic sense of nature, but it's completely reinvented and it's turned into some um, abstract concept. But you can see that all the carving relates back to nature, so they must have spent a lot of time looking at it. Whether they drew it or not, I don't know, but they certainly drew it when they carved it. The challenge is to draw the space and get that sense of vastness um, without it turning into chaos or, or without it becoming some pedantic piece of topography, which I wouldn't want it to become either if I was drawing it. This floor interests me as well, because it, it looks a bit like a Sean Scully painting, I've always thought. These different layers of, I don't know what the stone is, but it looks like an abstract painting. Beautiful, the glass is astonishing, and that's had an influence on me because one of my favourite painters is George Rohr, who, of course, was a stone glass apprentice. Uh, I think he's a little overlooked as a painter. The sense of colour uh, and sense of drama that you get within the, his bars of oil paints obviously relate to the, the bars of coloured glass with um, the lead separating them. So it's an inspiration, and the Five Sisters, of course, which is completely abstract. Very, very beautiful, restrained range of colour. Um, but I'm very, I'm passionately fond of it because I knew it from being you know, a tiny boy and it's the cathedral in the city I'm from, so I have an emotional attachment to it. We're on Bale Hill, um, just off Skeldergate Bridge, the ooze in front of me. I'm looking towards Clifford's Tower, which I'm drawing. Uh, the reason it's meaningful to me is um, I was brought up here a lot by my father when I was a young lad on Sunday walks. When I was a young lad at school at Dainsmead Secondary Modern, the library was 
pretty good and pretty extensive. And they had a book on European painting. And one of these books had a reproduction of Bruegel's The Gloomy Day from the seasons sequence of paintings. Uh, the gloomy day, I memory serves me, is February and March. I remember looking at the reproduction and thinking it, it's just like Bale Hill. It doesn't look like Bale Hill. It does a bit, actually, but it doesn't look obviously topographically like Bale Hill. There's no mountains around York. But the feeling of looking across uh, a medieval city from a raised viewpoint um, struck a chord with me. So I'd always liked the site. That gave it an extra frisson for me so I've made a lot of paintings of it and a lot of oil pastels and I still come up here and draw a lot which is what I'm doing today so it's got a lot of emotional um, attachments for me a lot of memories but they would be um, not of any interest if I couldn't express them through some objective drawing so trying to get all the trees in the right place Trying to get the tower the right size and shape in relation to the hill. Trying to get all the branches of the trees in the right place. Not in a way that's pedantic, I hope, but in a way that's intuitive. And therefore, has some added meaning. Is it the same as nostalgia? No, no, I think nostalgia is closer to sentiment. And nostalgia, it seems to me, is a little too close to sentimentality. So melan melancholia, think of the great engraving, the great uh, engraving by Dürer of melancholia that is not explicable in a linear way. It just sums up a certain kind of um, feeling. Well, I've walked round from Bale Hill now on the walls towards Micklegate Bar. There's a flag in the pathway along the walls here which struck me as a young boy um, as a kind of mysterious puzzle there's a carving there's a grid carved into the stonework with little crosses on it which looks like a puzzle and it struck me then that it was somehow a puzzle that if it could be solved would explain to me in some mysterious way my relationship to and emotional feelings for the city. So it seemed to me to be a kind of key to the city, the key to unlocking my emotional relationship to it in a completely irrational way. But then that's what poetry is, I suppose. Um, and there's a painting that corresponds to that, which is called The Key to the City. horizontal line is in the horizon, the, the little bit of grey above is just grey paint but it's also um, a metaphor for the sky. The other part of the painting is a distant um, extensive landscape and the ochre tablet in the middle is the key to the city. Can we talk a bit about the artists and teachers who helped you become a, an artist yourself yeah. who influenced you? Of course, of course we can. Um, as I say, I went to Dainsmead Secondary Modern School. There were, I think it was, there were six or seven or eight of us, and it was, a equally it was an equal balance of, uh, of, of young bo boys and girls. It wasn't a PC thing, I guess it wasn't that kind of period, it was just a happy coincidence. So we did O-level art, and it was the first, we were the first bunch that had done it. They usually did woodwork and metalwork. And if I'd have tried to make a living at woodwork and metalwork, <laughs> certainly wouldn't be here. Um, I'm not saying that the 60s was a panacea, I don't think it was. But you all know, I'm sure, the Colin Wellen teacher figure in Kez. And there's a, there was a kind of belief then that anybody could do anything. Which, and that's kind of diminished a bit, actually quite a lot. Uh, and that was wonderful. So we had, had that, that, that was my experience of that. But by the time you were doing the pre-dip course in York, you were already doing a lot of painting other than just what you needed to do. Yeah, absolutely. It was... I'm a painter by then. Yeah, it was an obsession. It, it was definitely an obsession. When we talk 
about this this very vexed term of uh, the provincial. To what extent is this taking some of the breakthroughs and the ideas that were achieved at, by the avant-garde quite far away, and then, as it were, taming them and bringing them back so that you change it and you alter it for local circumstances? Well, I think that happens a lot, actually. I mean, it happened in Wales, you know, with Piper. And equally in the north, you know, you have painters like uh, Jake Attry, who is, paints like Auerbach. Um, you know, you have Lowry, of course, who's a, a bit of an, an original and idiosyncratic. What's your reaction to being labelled as a northern artist? Well, I was told to have the radio on, and then I dropped the brush when I heard my little name check. I was, very, I was as shocked and stunned as everybody else was. Um, it's fine. I was born in the north, and I live in the north. I lived in London for quite a long time, but I like... I don't like the idea of being a northern artist. I like the idea of being a, idea of being an artist who is from and lives in the north. I don't think the north any better than the south. I don't think the east any better than the west. Uh, the reason that I'm very interested in Peter Bruegel is I think he, he, in a sense, he is a northern artist in that his his, his sensibility is Norse rather than Mediterranean. And he gives us a sense of, the, of northernness, which isn't some um, cliché or some parody. It's elegance, it's intelligence, and it's eloquent. And the language to the York Mystery Players, which I remember going to see when I was still at um, junior school, and saw the last performance recently as well. They both those performances, each beautiful and brilliant. Um, the language is intrinsically um, from York, obviously, it's the York Mystery Place, but it also has within its, um, within its cadence and within its, uh, its, its colloquialisms elegance, intelligence and eloquence, and that's what I endeavour to put in the painting, so hopefully they well, they'll have a sense of me more than a sense of northerners, but as I'm from the north, maybe they'll have a sense of northerners as well. So I wouldn't want to be labelled that, but uh, I'm not unhappy about it. I mean, you paint landscapes, cityscapes. A few portraits, but why so few portraits? Um, it's probably difficult to get people to sit. Uh, Picasso said about Braque that um, he would never be a portrait painter because he was too gentle. I think you need to you need to be a benign bully or coerce people into coming and sitting. Anybody out there fancies posing, they can uh, contact me. But the studio is not very really warm either, so maybe that puts sitters off. Yes, you couldn't really do life painting. Uh, me, not 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 for the winter months. No, probably not. Portraits. It does interest me. I suppose one could argue that well, they aren't really portraits of cities. Some are, not in this case. Well, coming back to York, I mean that's been the perennial sitter, really, isn't it? Yeah, it has. I think there are certain kinds of artists, two of whom I admire very, very deeply: Constable and Suzanne for whom their childhood was um, central to their sensibility and their aesthetic. And I'm not comparing myself to Constable Suzanne, please don't misunderstand me. I think I'm that kind of artist. So, York is physically very beautiful, but it wouldn't matter if it hadn't been. If I'd been born in Middlesbrough or somewhere in Dorset, it could have been anywhere. It, was, it would have been the place where I, I had my initial um, deeply felt emotional experiences and I think we have those as, as, a, as, as a, young, a young person, those formative experiences. It just happened to be, um, through an accident of birth, that it was York in my case. So there's no other real reason. The fact that it is physically very beautiful and has a reputation as a, as a tourist city has been perhaps in some ways a disadvantage. Who knows? I would just want to be um, thought of as, as, as a painter, nothing else. Not a painter from the north, not a painter of cities particularly, just a maker of paintings. You know, to me, um, Jay, that looks finished. It know, seems to me, when I come in on, on a morning, it seems to be a bit on the surface still. I like it to have some um, depth.
So I keep adding what I'm, I'm mixing what I think is the same colour just to fill in those little spaces that are darker or lighter but actually it's an infinitesimally different colour so that adds to a kind of, it, it gives it a little more richness that's not an intentional thing um, it's not a technique I've developed, I don't have a technique I just keep putting the stuff on in the hope that it will eventually look more or less Right, is that the correct word? Right, Probably is not. that the correct word? Probably not. Well, it's resolved the word that specific I painting. Um, How did you come to start it? Well, it began, and people do not believe me. Let me get this painting just to show the camera. It started like that, so they do start thinly. That's an underpainting in acrylic. So very thin looking for the darkest areas and the lightest areas so it works um, in terms of tonal values and then I begin to add diluted oil paint and then it just gets thicker A because I just love the surface of it and B it only feels real and I don't mean realistic well obviously not it only has a sense of um, reality to me as, as, a, as a painting when it has a kind of surface, it has a sort of uh, sense of itself as an object. Or it also has a sense of itself as a vast space with lots of figures in it as well. There's one of the drawings based on that Bruegel. As I don't drive, I hope I can put my hands on a sketchbook. Yes, that's fortuitous. As I don't drive, on the bus home, I make drawings in a sketchbook. There's another drawing for this painting. And there's another drawing just about directions. And there's another drawing. So as I'm on the bus, I'll be getting bumped about and jostled and jogged as the bus moves and that makes the drawings have a look that I couldn't achieve otherwise perhaps. Um, and then there were drawings and watercolours I made a long time ago when we lived in London at Finsbury Park. There's one of the watercolours. So that kind of links into that. The figures, so it's, it's a it's a composite. I think when I was educated at, at Liverpool and the Royal Academy, some of the tutors I had would probably have had an issue with that. Perhaps, I don't know. But at 65 years of age, I'm extremely old, um, I think it's about time I stopped worrying about what other people thought. I'm just, I'm too long in the tooth to care. Composite landscape. From those sources. terrified we we're going to get no more than four drawings but we've got a wall full as you can see we and more a, we've a, got a, a massive we have pile a, elsewhere uh, this is a small selection we had a pile that thick um mm. that gabby's gone through kindly mm. it's now in that cupboard in fact it doesn't fill the cupboard but we've had a lot of drawings and there's a continued interest um in it in it in mm. this particular venture there's a, I think it's also inaugurated a debate about what drawing might be in the city and the initiative can't continue in here because this space is needed for other ventures, obviously, other initiatives and exhibitions. Um, but I think so, don't you? That mm. There is an appetite for it to happen in the city that, I mean, this initiative continues. So like-minded people can um, meet together parapathetically, if the day is like it is today, um, go and draw in the museum gardens or on the walls or wherever, or they could meet in appointed places um, that were decided among themselves, someone's house, for example. Or maybe a dedicated space will be offered. Who knows? So, 
how do you think it's gone so? It's gone incredibly well. We've, we've had um, some wonderful responses. We've had drawings made from, I think the youngest I've seen is about 18 months, yeah. and um, right up to all ages. But, but it's been wonderful just listening to people's what drawing means to them and how that it, it is an it, in many cases it's an emotional um, attachment it's it's something quite felt how they feel about it when they're drawing whether they feel relaxed or calm or making sense of things or any of those things so those conversations have been really yes we've it had a huge to relax, calm down um, and enjoy fun that's a good one isn't it it is fun but it's been also been really nice, really interesting, listening to different people's approaches to drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Jake's been brilliant, sharing his sort of vast knowledge of drawing, which has been well, fantastic. Well, I'm very, very old, and they're doing it very, very long time. Because what it's seen, what, what what looking at very, very young children's drawings have done for me is they um, remind remind me, and I hope I don't forget it, but I do sometimes forget it, I suppose. It's helped. It helps to keep alive the child that lives in all of us. And if that dies, then not a lot of point going on, isn't it? And it doesn't, but sometimes you feel it has. So drawing um, isn't the only way, but it's the way that I um, rekindle that child that lives in all of us. If you're looking at something in the real world, that or this or whatever it is you're drawing, a camera for example, your attempt, the subject will be that, what you try, that which you are trying to draw, but the subject will also be your attempt to draw it. So the history of it, the rubbings out, the corrections, mm. the correction is the wrong word, you, you don't get it wrong, you get it less truthful than you might like it. So as you look at it more, you begin to see it better, and then that means, for me, the drawing will change and alter. But all that change and alteration is part of the uh, history of the attempt to understand what it is you're looking at. So it's about focus, I think, and um, single-mindedness, which isn't the same as recurring habitual practice. You need to be aware of that. So you need to strike a balance between the two. Yes, I would say for me, um, having had the privilege of working with Jake for three, four months, is that's the thing that's come over the most, is his, you know, uh, strong, um, um, persistent quest to find what he's what he's drawing. His his work ethic is astonishing. I was fortunate enough to see his studio, which was which was wonderful, and um, just his just his his you know need to not need it just uh, all right it's need to want to attain and and find that that thing that he's that he's drawing and the essence of it. And um, he, and, I, and and the other thing I've learned most, I think, is this is this thing of of struggling with the drawing and and the, the history of it that, that Jake's just described through the through the, the the rubbing out and the or maybe not all the drawing over or whatever and the, and the actual history of that struggle to to make that um, depiction on the on the page or the or the canvas or whatever that Jake's using. And that's been an absolute privilege to watch um, and hear. Well, that's very kind, to. sir. It's been a mutual privilege. I do draw all the time, um, so, so, so I'll show you that I practice what I preach. I've got a sketchbook here. sense of wonder that one has about the world, looking at it and trying to record it, that might come about through drawing or embroidery or dance or any other um, kind of discipline, but for me it's drawing. So I sit at the, anywhere on the street and just draw. I don't drive, so I'll draw, I'll draw on the bus back home. But you'll be drawing an interesting looking building, like you might be drawing the North Transept, and it goes okay at the Minster. 
you get back on the bus, you're just trying to get you're just trying to get the, the, the handle, the hand grips in the right place and the seat back to the seats. And you make a much more interesting drawing doing that than you do drawing the cathedral. It's the way that I explain the world to myself wordlessly.